I look on the resurrection story that is given to us in Luke as a rescue operation. Jesus had every right to literally appear to them and instead of doing what he is doing, winning their hearts, showing who he really is, he could have said, you have denied me and really come after them. The fact that he did not do that says something about both his understanding of what it means to be human and the extraordinary nature of his mercy and his forgiveness. Because, I mean, he doesn't even mention it. He doesn't, you know, we have people who want to forgive, but then they remind us. <laughs> uh, he, he doesn't do that. He doesn't even mention the problem. They're in there, of course, and the way the story lands is, they're all gathering together. They're beginning to hear stories from various individuals about how Jesus has appeared to them, including most recently the Road to Emmaus story appears directly just before this one. And so they are back telling the disciples about what happened along the road. But remember, there is no category for them about anything like this happening. I mean, it would be, I heard somebody said, it would be like trying to introduce somebody from medieval era about what a lawnmower does. I mean, there's no category for how you even think about things like electricity and all the things that go into, that we take for granted. The same thing. So obviously, they think a ghost has appeared. And so Jesus goes out of his way to say, no, no, this is really a human body. Come and Come and touch me, he invites. And then, of course, sits down and literally eats in front of them. You know, C.S. Lewis's famous line, ghosts don't eat fish. And does so, according to one commentator, he eats with relish, like it's been a long time since I've had a good meal. As a way to say, he is fully here. Not exactly in the same way. Remember, he just appears in the middle of the room. Um, there is something different about this resurrection body, which is why we're very clear to say this is resurrection, not resuscitation. Something new has happened to the body of Jesus. But it's still him in every single recognizable way. And so what he's trying to say, it seems to me, is like I said, first to rescue them from their own fears, to rescue them from their own guilt, to rescue them from any sense that fellowship between them is irretrievably broken. Just the opposite. He's coming after them in all the good ways. He is pursuing them as a lover to show them all of who he is. He holds back in no way whatsoever. And so that's really the first story because part of what we're trying to learn here is who is this Jesus? And what is his character like? And so what, for me, the, the takeaway is the tremendous nature of his mercy. The extraordinary level of his forgiveness. Truly, as Paul writes later in Romans, there is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no remembrance of sin's past. There is no calling to account. There is, in fact, just as if it never happened in a way that is meant to refresh, to heal, and to restore. Not freed and forgiven so that I can go back and do whatever I want, but freed and forgiven so that I might know that in his presence is the refreshment that I long for and that in him is the fulfillment of all of my life you see, so often sin is in fact an effort to escape, to, to find a way to withdraw out of whatever it is in terms of pain that I'm enduring, the difficulties in finding a way to get out of it, to not have to think about it for a while. And more often than not, human beings that we are, flesh human beings that we are, a lot of what we choose to do to, in essence, escape inevitably creates what we would consider to be the mistreatment of the body. And so Jesus is saying, no, there really is a fulfillment in me. 
that invites us into a different relationship with God himself that takes away the sting that would cause us to go in the directions that would actually take us further away from the union with Christ to which we are being invited. In other words, the presence of God is always much better than any kind of sinful relief we might try to choose to escape from the pain. And that's a part of what Jesus is saying to him. And in coming, come, saying to them, and in coming to them and being very clear about the fact that he, this is a human body that is showing up, is also saying, in a, in a similar sense, that actually who we are in the body actually matters. He's not presenting ghost as a better way of life, freed from the shackles of the human flesh. Instead, he comes as a resurrected, bodily embodied Jesus to them, share, show, showing in a very clear way that the body is meant for redemption, not rejection. The body is meant for redemption and not rejection. And therefore, what we do with the body matters. Who we are in the body actually matters. There is no place in the Christian gospel for thinking your way through this. It's in fact an embodied experience where we receive into all of who we are and we give out of whole all the who we are. It's never merely an intellectual exercise. And in fact, intellectual exercises can be their own way to escape from the pain in the body. It's just less noticeably sinful. And so, this is a very clear statement that what happens here and what I do with this that I've been given by God profoundly matters to God. And that who we are meant to be is somebody who doesn't just sort of think in a particular way, but literally embodies our relationship with Jesus. It's the way we, in our actions and in our attitudes, express who we are in Christ, which is why the forgiveness is so critically important. To quote the Old Testament, he knows whereof we are made. He remembers that we are but dust. And that's why the mercy and the forgiveness is so important, because we are almost inevitably inclined to the sin of self-preservation or the sins of escape as opposed to moving toward God into the place, in the places of difficulty, receiving from him that which satisfies the soul, which allows us to say to sin, that's not worthy of me. That's not who I am. I'm being called to something much higher, much bigger, and much, much better. So you see, it's a, it's a kind of circle in a way. He comes in the form of a human body to present irrevocable evidence that he is totally resurrected from the dead and invites them into a relationship with him that calls us to be a part of and to receive and to give all of who we are. And out of that, we have a new kind of reverence for who we are bodily as well as intellectually and emotionally because all of us are in the creation of God and are all being redeemed. All of who we are is being redeemed. And therefore, when we get into those places of sin that would want us to split mind from body, that is exactly the thing that the enemy would try to do to somehow create a wedge between this kind of embodied life to which we have been called. And because that's who we are, God knows wherever we are made, and he always comes and brings mercy for, and forgiveness because becoming is not easy. It's just not easy. And yet we are becoming. We are being remade. The presence of the Holy Spirit that is inside of us is radiating in and through body and mind. And therefore we are becoming people who more and more reflect and pour out the very life and presence of Jesus. That's the message of the gospel this morning. 
shorthand is the collect, that they may show forth in their lives what they profess by their faith. That there is an embodied existence to which we have been called that Jesus shows us. And that to get into that way of life is not easy. It takes a lot of mercy and forgiveness, both on ourselves as well as in how we seek God. But the end result is men and women who in fact embody the presence of God in the world. And that's really the call. That's the testimony of the resurrected life. To be and to become men and women who really by character and life reflect something of the radiance of the resurrection of Jesus. Amen.